When I saw the theme Back to the Future, I thought it was really related to antimicrobial stewardship. Two reasons for that. Uh, first of all, a lot of the antibiotics that have been developed over the last 10 to 20 years have actually come from families of antibiotics that were discovered 60 to 80 years ago. It can be a lot simpler to make some structural changes and make a new antibiotic for a known family rather than come up with something completely new. Uh, so scientists are looking at those old antibiotics and trying to develop something new. The second reason for that is that bacteria are fighting back. So there is a rise in antimicrobial resistance. And if we don't get on top of that, it may set us back 100 years when we don't have antibiotics, and even a small infection could have caused severe harm. So we do need to look after antibiotics to make sure that they still work effectively. So I wanted to start with just telling you a little bit about what I do. I'm a pharmacist, but I don't work in a high street pharmacy. I work in a hospital. I mostly work on a hospital ward. And the healthcare system nowadays is very multidisciplinary. Everyone has got their own little role in the patient journey. So, of course, as a pharmacist, I look after the medicines. I need to make sure that we have sufficient stock of antibiotics and other medicines, uh, enough vaccines for our patients. And if there's drug shortages or manufacturing issues, I need to have a look at uh, obtaining alternative uh, medicines for our patients. Uh, but I also do teaching sessions. I uh, educate staff on uh, responsible use of antimicrobials uh, and go help them choose the right treatment for patients. I work closely with doctors, help them to choose the right medicines, the right antibiotics for our patients, and help them with adjusting the doses for patients with renal impairment or liver impairment. I work with the nursing staff as well. I help them to administer medicines safely to patients and make sure we have enough stock of the medicines for the patients to look after. I also work with the wider antimicrobial uh, team, the microbiology team, infectious diseases team, to create guidelines for our first-line antibiotics. And finally, I work with patients too. I supply medicines for them so that they can take them home, and I give them advice on how to take them, and what side effects to look out for. So there's a variety of uh, roles that I have, and I do really enjoy my job, which is quite varied. But I, uh, I specialize in antimicrobial stewardship. Antibiotics are a little bit different to other medicines. Behind me is a timeline of when antibiotics were discovered. And as you can see, a lot of them were discovered between the 1940s and the 1970s. And at the bottom, you can see when we started noticing signs of antibiotic resistance in, to those antibiotics. So for some of them, it only took a couple of years for bacteria to adapt and become uh, show signs of resistance. Now, so because of how long ago this, some of these uh, antibiotics were produced, it's quite likely that if you had a common infection now, like a pneumonia or a urinary tract infection, the antibiotics we would use for you today will be very similar to the antibiotics we used for your parent or your grandparent, whether they're the same age as you. And with the upcoming of resistance, uh, it doesn't mean that if a uh, bacteria becomes resistant, then you know, we're not, uh, not able to use those antibiotics anymore. As you can see, for penicillin, it started showing signs of resistance in 1947. But we still use penicillin nowadays. It's still a very effective drug. But we just need to do surveillance locally to see what our bacteria is like, how much resistance there is in our area. That's why antimicrobial stewardship is so important, because uh, the resistance in our area here could be very different to what it's like up north or down south or in Asia or Americas. So we make uh, local guidelines for antibiotics. We look at the resistance in our area and tailor the treatments in accordance to, uh, with that. So uh, bacteria are fighting back. They're developing resistance. And the problem is the multi-drug resistant bacteria, which uh, are resistant to multiple antibiotics. So the World Health Organization created a report in 2019 uh, saying that if the resistance continues at current rate, by 2050, there may be up to 10 million deaths a year around the world from, uh, caused by multidrug resistant bacteria. That's 10 times more than at present, which is why we need to use our antibiotics responsibly um, uh, to slow the rate of that happening. So antimicrobial resistant infections are happening. Uh, it's not science fiction. It's not something that's happening beyond the UK. It's happening everywhere. This is a bacteria that we've isolated from one of our patients. You've got the name of the bacteria at the top and the antibiotics that were tested against it. Uh, R means resistant and N means sensitive. 
So as you can see, there was only one antibiotic on the list that we could use to treat this infection. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's something wrong in our hospital, in our local population. This is happening everywhere. People are finding these organisms all over the world in a very small percentage of patients. But if resistance continues at the same rate, this could become more common. And this antibiotic, cathederocol, is a very good example of looking back at what we have and creating something new. So cathederocol is, uh, is, it belongs to a family called cephalosporins. Cephalosporins were first discovered in 1945, and they were clinically used in 1964. They're very similar drug to penicillin that we're all familiar with. Now, what the scientists did was they used AI screening and created a bunch of molecules, and they've tested them against a number of multidrug-resistant bacteria. And they've noticed that this particular molecule, cathederocol, was very effective at killing the multidrug-resistant bacteria. So in 2020, it was approved to be used in the European Union, and it's one of the antibiotics we can use now for multidrug-resistant infections. So what does cathederocol do that's a little bit different? How is it able to kill that multidrug-resistant bacteria? Well, I've created a little animation here to help you understand that. So the capsule here is the antibiotic, and it's attached to a little iron atom. Now, bacteria need iron for their metabolic processes. So what happens is the bacteria takes the iron in, and it doesn't even realize that it's got the antibiotic attached to it. So the antibiotic is able to bypass the first line of defense for the bacteria. And bacteria have uh, enzymes that break down uh, some antibiotics. Uh, but because this molecule is different, uh, so the enzyme is represented by the scissors here. Because this antibiotic is different, the bacteria doesn't recognize it as something that it needs to destroy, and therefore uh, it's not able to. Uh, some bacteria have those uh, pumps as well that can pump out the antibiotics uh, so that it doesn't act on it. Uh, but again, because of the structural changes to it, uh, the pump is represented by the exit sign here. It manages to avoid it, and the bacteria is not able to get rid of it. Uh, so by making those changes, uh, the antibiotic is able to stay in the bacteria and kill the bacteria. Another interesting development is dalbavancin. It's an antibiotic that belongs to a, a family of antibiotics called glycopeptides, which were discovered back in the 1950s. The first glycopeptide was vancomycin, uh, which is still in use today. We use it a lot for MRSA infections that you might have heard of or for some infections uh, for patients with a penicillin allergy. Now, the problem with vancomycin is that it needs to be given intravenously and needs to stay in a very specific range in the blood. If, the, if, it's, if its concentration is too low, it's not effective enough. And if it's too high, it can become toxic to your kidneys. Uh, so you need very close monitoring and multiple doses throughout the day. Now, scientists look at developing a new glycopeptide, which they call dalbavancin. Uh, which was approved in the EU in 2015. Uh, and by the modifications that they've done to the molecule to manage to extend its half-life. So half-life of medicine is, it means how long it takes for half of it to be removed from the body. So vancomycin has a half-life of four to six hours, and dalbavancin's half-life is 15 days. So what that means is that even a single dose of this antibiotic, or even two doses, may be enough to treat an infection. Uh, and would allow perhaps for patients to be discharged from hospital sooner because they wouldn't need repeat doses of IV antibiotics. Now, those two were success stories where scientists managed to come up with a new uh, antibiotic, but that's not always the case. Plasmycin is another antibiotic which belongs to a family called aminoglycosides, which are discovered back in the 40s. The company that developed it invested millions of dollars into developing this new drug. Uh, however, and it was effective against many multidrug resistant bacteria. It was approved to be used in 2018 in the United States, but the company that developed it bankrupt only a couple of months after that. So the unusual thing with antibiotics is that because we use the new one only when the old ones don't work for the multidrug resistant bacteria, uh, we don't use that many of them. And because plasmomycin wasn't used very often, uh, one of the reasons why the company bankrupt was because they were making a lot of money for it, from it. And therefore, uh, they were not making money back from the investment that they've made. Uh, so this shows that developing antibiotics is not just chemistry, uh, it's also economy. So what we're doing in the UK is a new subscription model. Currently, there's only two antibiotics that are part of this model. 
But what is happening there is that the companies that are developing those antibiotics um, are getting a stable cash flow, regardless of the use of those antibiotics, to give them a little bit of a reassurance so they can make investments in developing new antibiotics uh, because there is no, no matter of the usage uh, for them, in order to keep working on new antibiotics that we can use in the future. Uh, so it has been highlighting the new antimicrobial uh, resistant plan for the next five years that the subscription model has worked really well and we'll be looking at expanding that with addition of newer antibiotics to it. Um, so in this plan there's also been a few commitments about public awareness and engagement about antimicrobial resistance and antimicrobial stewardship. So if you're interested in this topic and you're enjoying this talk there should be more things coming up in the next couple of years. But I just thought to end I could just share with you a couple of things that you can do right now to help with this problem. Well, first of all, it's infection prevention. So wash your hands, get your vaccines on time. It's much easier to prevent an infection rather than treating it. So that should be the first step. Second of all, antibiotic use. So do not take antibiotics if you don't need them. If you do have an infection that's serious and your doctor advises you to take antibiotics, antibiotics by all means, you should take them and you should complete the course. But Sometimes when you have a common cold, which could be a viral infection, you may not actually need antibiotics and they're not going to help you. So uh, if you don't need antibiotics and your doctor is telling you that you don't need antibiotics, do not put the pressure on them to try to prescribe them to you. Uh, there's a campaign called Keep Antibiotics Working, which focuses on that uh, really well, what we can do to keep our antibiotics uh, working. The third thing is allergy. Know your allergy status and it sure is recorded well on your medical record. Now, the data is showing that a lot of people think they have an, um, an allergy to antibiotics, uh, often to penicillin. But the data shows that uh, very often this might have not actually been an allergy, but a side effect or a family member was allergic to a penicillin. And people think that they have an uh, allergy to that as well. Um, and sometimes it's recorded that very poorly on the medical records. So I would encourage you, if you think you have an antibiotic allergy, but you're not certain, just to work with your doctor to, make, to check if it is an actual allergy and that is recorded on your, on your record correctly. So thank you very much for that. Hope you enjoyed that.